glad to see everybody the, that's here on this holiday weekend. Um, could have been up north, so I appreciate everybody here. Um, I want to take the, I'm Tom, Tom McMahon, I'm one of the elders here, so good morning. But if you're a guest here this morning, I want to welcome you, and um, you can use the scan code out there if you would. That would help us to get to know you a little bit better and um, come alongside you uh, as you visit and use Journey. So I wanted to um, tell you a little bit about our groups, our Journey groups. Um, we have, right now, 16 different groups that are here, and there are literally 157 of you in those groups, but here's the cool part. There are 25 brand new members that are in the groups. So if you're interested in getting into a journey group, right now would be the time. So, because they're about to get started. So we are a church that um, reaches wider and walks deeper. And what that means is we're into relationships. So as we invite people to journey, we develop relationships. And the way we walk deeper with them is we get involved in Bible studies and discipleship. So the best way to do that is to get involved in a journey group. So I appreciate you doing that, and it will change your life because you walk through life together. And when you have things that happen to you in life, you have really close people that you can do that with. So as Carlisle gets ready to come up, I just want to take a moment and pray if that's okay. Father God, right now in these times, there's a lot of anxiousness and nervousness in our nation, and I just wanted to just ask you to remind us that you are the God who created the heavens and the earth. There is nothing too big for you, nothing that you can't handle. So you have put kings and queens and politicians in place, and you do that all for your purpose and your glory. So we just ask you to Remind us of that all the time. And I pray, God, that this morning that you will just speak through Carlisle boldly and you will speak directly into our hearts, Lord. God, we love you. Amen. And here's Allie. Good morning, everybody. Super excited to be up here this Sunday with Miss Lily. She's going to be reading our verses. We do need some more volunteers. We want to see your kids get involved. We want to see them in the Word. So we encourage you to encourage them to get up here. They can come up here with any of their coaches. They can come up here with me. We just want to see them up here reading. So we're going to have Lily read Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you until heaven and earth pass away, not an Ida, did I say it right? Ida, um, not a dot with pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of the com commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches um, teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven for I tell you unless your righteousness exceeds that that of the scribes and Pharisees Pharisees you will never come you will never enter the um, the kingdom of heaven good job Lily can we give her a hand Three to seventy-eight, best hour of the week, right? 
It was pretty important in my family. That was quality family time right there. You're lucky I only gave you two and a half minutes of the six million dollar man. My family was a fan. My, my mom really liked Lee Majors. My dad, as did all men, liked Farrah Fawcett a lot. Um, my brother, my younger brother, had a little action figure of the six million dollar man. I was um, more a fan of Lindsay Wagner. I was kind of, she was the bonnet woman, and I was a little bit girl crazy. Um, my brother liked Farrah, by the way. He had both posters of Farrah in his room. I had a poster of Wonder Woman. That's who I was partial to, even more than Lindsay Wagner. But <clears throat> my mother, because she thought I was a little too girl crazy, as if that could be a thing, she, um, in all of her sweetness, took Linda Carter down and replaced her with a picture of Jesus, my savior. <laughs> and Linda was in the garbage the next morning, wrinkled up, and I did say goodbye to her and left Jesus on my wall, and it changed my life. But anyway, that, that's, the, that's the bionic man the story. Um, the, the hardest part, one of the episodes, I remember when Lindsay Wagner became the bionic woman, <clears throat> she had an accident too, and she and Steve were in love with each other in love. They were going to get married. And then she had the accident. She became the bionic woman. And she forgot. She had amnesia, something about becoming bionic. And she forgot that the love of her life. And it broke my heart. I couldn't believe it. And Steve was with her, but she fell in love with the doctor instead. And Steve just wouldn't tell her about them. I was like, Steve, just tell her. Just tell her. She'll fall in love with you again. And he never would tell her. He stayed on the high road. He was a, a noble man, even though I thought it was a Bad decision. So even the best technology and six million dollars still couldn't get it all right. He still suffered from a broken heart. The reason I wanted to use that analogy, I could use it a bunch because I was such a fan, but some things never change. Some things never change. Since the dawn of man, we have been trying to improve ourselves to be bigger and different than God ever intended us to be. That's why we're going to look at this six million dollar man. It'll come up from time to time today. In fact, that's exactly what happened in the garden. <clears throat> Adam and Eve were given instructions by God to be human because he was God. But then the tempter came and used these words, you're not going to die. You'll be just like him. That's what he's afraid of. You'll be just like him to be something they weren't supposed to be. That's what they were tempted into. So they longed for more than God designed for them. They longed for more than God ever intended for them. They vied for the wrong thing and they moved backwards into sin and humankind fell. He short, God shortened their leash a little bit, gave them some instructions. It continued to their kids. Their kids continued to their kids and on down to me. As it continued, during the time of Moses, God did a thing. He shortened the leash again, gave 10 things. You know what they are? 10, what are they? Commandments. Good job. You read your Bible once or twice. Good job. Good job on us. The 10 commandments. But even then, the momentum was still towards unrighteousness. The Ten Commandments did a little bit of help, but not much. What God made, man is always trying to make better. That's the problem. What God made, man is always trying to make better. Our own versions of the six million dollar man or the six million dollar woman. The things that we are trying to do to compensate for our needs, desires, passions that aren't even of God. That's the, the real human problem is that we're trying to reconstruct ourselves not in God's image, but in our image, by our own efforts. Even if we could spend $6 million, we could never reconstruct ourselves to be who God made us to be without Jesus. We are who we're supposed to be with Jesus, not with our own constructs. So the main idea of the day is this. <clears throat> Jesus did not come to deconstruct us but to reconstruct us into what God intended for us to be in the first place. So I'm going to give you some context of the three verses, and then we'll, we're going to hit on a few other verses. I'm going to mention them. You're going to read up through, I think it's verse 26. Next week, we carry on to there. But the quick context is, Madnik is the, the Sermon on the Mount, the kingdom backwards. That's what Madnik is, kingdom spelled backwards. And so Jesus is doing this Sermon on the Mount, and he has taken his disciples and taken them away. And if you remember, we keep repeating it. What a disciple is is someone who is learning from Jesus to be like Jesus. You should get that memorized because that's our quest too as a discipleship church, is to learn from Jesus to be like Jesus. It's that simple, to learn from him to be like him. But in this group, there was a separate group. So it's kind of like Jesus is preaching to his disciples, and there was this, this other group like 
over here. Sorry, you guys are going to be that group. Uh, that was a mixed group. And here's who's in that group. We have the scribes. They were experts in the preciseness of the written law, the Sadducees, expert in the day-to-day -day application of the law, and then the Pharisees, experts following the letter of the law. So it's like he takes this pause, and he's talking to all of you, and then he goes over to these people. And they're looking at me like you're looking at me. Furrowed brow. A furrowed brow of dissatisfaction and not sure if he's got it right. Maybe even confusion. That's what was going on, scrutinizing. They were taking notes. Not like taking notes. They were taking notes. Get it? That's what they were doing. They had been impressed like the rest of the crowds for what they had seen Jesus do. They, they were even impressed about what they heard Jesus say, but they just weren't quite sure. And I, I called this group like the pre-haters, you know, like they weren't haters yet, but they were about to be all out haters of Jesus. Right now they were considering whether they were going to be haters of Jesus. They were impressed, but they were cautious. Jesus' approach was pretty new, it was pretty fresh, but they weren't sure because they thought maybe even it was wrong. It was definitely different, and it challenged their way of life. Now, to their credit, this group, they were doing their job. That, that was their job, and so that's what they were doing. I like to think of them as sheriffs of the Torah and the writings, which was the Bible of Jesus' day, the Torah, the first five books, and the rest of the Old Testament. They were the sheriffs. They were, as we talked last week, consequential influencers is what Salt and Light was last week. They were consequential influencers of the Torah and of the writings. They were on guard to preserve the law and the writings, and they had a clear commission, and it comes from Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 3. I'm going to read it to you. This was their job. <clears throat> if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass. And if he says, let's go up after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So I think their translation was, new guy in town, it's our job to make sure that he's not getting it wrong, that he's not an imposter, so we're going to take heavy tabs on him and we're going to furrow our brow every chance we get to see what he's up to. So that's what they were doing. So Jesus is a, a friend of the outsiders. They, they've seen that. He is a friend of the tax collectors and the sinners, people who barely even knew what the Torah and the writings were, let alone followed them. The scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, were, they were friends of the insiders, of the political and religious elite, people like them. So their filter was to listen to how Jesus esteemed or loved what they loved, the Torah and the writings. They loved the rules. They saw Jesus doing things and saying things that were a little different. They loved loving the law without living the law out. And that text said, Jesus said, that's not the way we do it. We love the law and we live the law out. And they weren't doing such a good job of living the law out. They had worked really hard. They had a whole way of life. They loved themselves and their way of life more than what Jesus was trying to do. And so they got so hating of him, they got so much in the hater group that they started to conspire soon after this to murder him, which they succeeded in doing. But Jesus knew that because Jesus actually came to die for them too. He was doing what he was going to do for them as much as he was doing it for me. So really what I think was happening is it was like a change management thing. And Jesus was a little soft at the beginning because I think when, when change comes to us, we always resist it. Or is it just me? We have our systems. We have our way of doing things that work for us. And someone comes in and says, I don't know if you got that quite right. Can I propose to you a change? And we're like, oh, who do you think you are, first of all? And that's what they were doing. And who are you to tell me what to do with my life? And so Jesus is starting to call them out. First, he's a little nice, and then he takes them from pre-haters to haters, and he says in verse 24, I tell you, he's talking to everyone here, giving them the side eye over there, unless your righteousness exceeds or superabounds, is what the word means, that of the scribes of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You will never experience the blessings of heaven here on earth now, which is what the Sermon on the Mount's about. And they move firmly into the hater camp. That was the tipping point. So, that gives us a chance to take a, a, a breather just for a second and apply this to our lives. Here's the thing. We don't like change. 
especially change that we didn't ask for. We, and we don't like being called out. And the whole group was being called out, especially the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. And that's a typical human reaction. When our systems are questioned, when they're brought into doubt, people bring them into doubt. Even when we know that they might be right in our systems of doing things, of living life and getting by, don't quite work for us. Being called out is um, a little bit of a challenge. I, I call it the pigsty syndrome. So if you, if you were living in a pigsty, which sometimes our systems are, we have to admit, it's a, like an enclosed area. Uh, it's predictable. We're used to it. Um, it stinks, but we're used to it. We eat garbage, but we're used to it. So it's working for me. Don't mess with my pigsty. That's the pigsty syndrome. That's what's happening here. But the hard fact is that Jesus was addressing something, and he goes on to address it in verses 21 through 23 that we didn't read for you, that you can spend time. It talks about anger, lust, murder, and divorce, which are all symptoms of a life that's not lived out with the law, that's only knowledge of the law. And that's what he was trying to get at. So <clears throat> the main idea of the day, I want to reiterate it. Jesus did not come to deconstruct us, but to reconstruct us because we've been making a $6 million man. We've been making a $6 million woman. So they were into the law more than they were into the life. They were into the law of God more than they were into the people of God. They were into their systems, into their pigsty. And Jesus is calling us out. And Jesus said, I want to reconstruct that. I want, you to, I want to get you out of the pigsty. So the law. When we think of the law, the, the, us moderners, what do we think of? The law is the Ten Commandments, which we got into. But when you start to read that, you know what immediately follows the Ten Commandments? 613 more. 623. It's in here. Look it up. It's in here. It starts with 10. It continues on for pages and pages and pages, and there's 613 more. And they're all still good. What are we going to do with all those? Well, every once in a while, people reading in their Old Testament, and it's like they, they discover something the first time for them. And you hear about these fads like the Daniel diet in Daniel chapter 1. People go, ooh, the Daniel diet has to be the, the key to everything the, for cleansing and for fasting. Do the Daniel diet and it'll change your life. And then there's the Bible diet, the unprocessed food diet which would make sense back then, but, or sprouted grains only diet, things like that. We go, oh, that, that's the ticket. We think it's new. It's in there. It's, a, it's in the Bible. And then we get into the New Testament and we look at things like in Acts 10, Peter's vision, when, when Jesus says to him, do not call anything unclean that I have made clean. So we start to get confused with the New Testament. And then Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians 6.12 that says, all things are permissible. Not all things are beneficial, but all things are permissible. So uh, lighten up, and, but be careful. So is the Old Testament and those 613 things, do we take it? Do we leave it? What do we do with all this stuff? It's a little confusing. Is it in effect now? So I'm here to tell you what is in effect now is Jesus. That's what's in effect. And that's what Jesus said. Jesus validates everything. He doesn't invalidate anything. He validates everything, and he says, I am the fulfillment. And that word means I have come to the very top. It couldn't be any more fulfilled than how it is fulfilled right now in me. That's what Jesus is saying, that he's the culmination of everything that is written. He's not canceling out. He's actually living it out before their very eyes. He's filling it to the top. He's living it out in life. Exactly how life as a human was supposed to be lived, Jesus is living it to the full. The good life now, Jesus was living it. So interesting enough, as, as you start to think about all these 623 things, do we follow, do we not follow, there's two other layers that I haven't even mentioned in the, in the um, Israeli tradition. The Talmud, do you know what that is? It's a commentary on the Torah. So instead of $6 million man constructing $6 million woman, what they've constructed is 4 million words to go on top of this. Four million words, five times as big as this. Five times. Imagine that's like this, this tall. More. Does it? They've added to it. That's what they've done. Five times as long, and they stopped writing it about the fifth century AD. But they didn't stop there. Right now, in modern times, the halakha is an ongoing commentary on our social issues and the Jewish tradition of how to bear these things out. And then there's this. 
and it has continued on. I looked it up to see what they're considering these days. Here's the list. Medical ethics, organ transplantation, genetic testing, end-of-life care. They're trying to see how it corresponds or doesn't correspond. Maybe we can make some exceptions. Technology, artificial intelligence, social media, cryptocurrency. They're considering that and how it corresponds or doesn't correspond to the Torah. Social issues like interfaith marriage, same-sex relationships, environmental concerns, and economic issues. These are things right now. Interest rates, business ethics, and economic justice. You know what that actually sounds like? It'd be a really good lineup for the debate that's coming, right? I, I'm not trying to be political, but those are the concerns of our days, and that's what they're trying to do. Take, they're trying to construct a $6 million man to correspond our life with what God has already told us eons ago. Tweaking and changing God's intentions. Constructing a $6 million man, and it started happening in chapter 3, and it still hasn't stopped. So here's the point. This is what this tells me about Israel, about Jewish people, and about me, and about you. That we strive for understanding of and control over our circumstances. We strive to understand things so we can control things. That's our striving. Not to strive to live in righteousness. We're trying to build our own $6 million man. And God has said from the beginning that the best control over your circumstances is pursuing righteousness. Period. That's the best control. You actually have control over whether you pursue righteousness or you don't. That's all on you. But Jesus knew the struggle. Jesus was trying to get to the root of the problem. Not 613 roots. Not 4 million words of roots. He's trying to get to the one root. Instead of a $6 million man or a $4 million document or 613 roots, it's only three letters. Y-O-U. You. That's what he's trying to get to the root of. You. Those people then and us now are treating our symptoms of our systems. We have systems. We've constructed systems that work for us. Fix die stuff. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to reconstruct that for you. Jesus was trying to get to, I know that you like that pigsty stuff, the way you acquire, the way that you are attracted to it. We're going to do something with that. I'm going to deal with your inner lives. And that's the key. That's what he's getting at. He wants to, you to live out the law to understand that you need to deal with you. So Jesus is trying to get to the root of your problem too. The root of our problem is that we can't even really do the 10 good, let alone 613 more, let alone the others that have been added in their system and in yours. So you may think, as you think about the Ten Commandments, I, I haven't murdered anyone. The rest of the verses that I didn't read to you, Jesus says, all these things you actually are guilty of because the seeds of it are in your heart. Your root has that stuff in it. That's what comes next. We're not going to read about it, but I'm just going to give you some examples. You commit murder and adultery and you have anger problems. You forsake a human by murdering them in your heart through your anger. That's what Jesus says. It starts in your heart. Sometimes you might think, what drives someone to murder someone else? Jesus says, it's that anger thing in your heart. One thing leads to another. I know about that firsthand. Some of you know my story. I'm only going to mention it for a second. I'll tell you why in a second. My adopted father was murdered in the front yard of the house I grew up in in front of my neighbors by a guy who had anger in his heart, and he murdered him dead on New Year's Day 42 years ago. So I know about that one, okay? Um, What about marriage? So you forsake the love of your life. You alter your family forever because of the desires of your heart. You might think that there are other things like ego or sexual satisfaction or happiness or whatever, but affairs start in your heart. And unfortunately, in my young life, before I was even 20 years old, I had experienced that from my family of upbringing four times. Four times. Four remarriages. Actually, as I think about it, five. So why am I telling you that? Well, let's talk about friendships for a second. I've had friendships that have ended. Haven't you? We've all had that. So we all got at least the third one in common. Maybe I'm so special because I have the super tragedies of the first two. But here's the point of what I'm trying to make. The fact is we've experienced this thing and Jesus is not saying, I've come because I know that you've experienced those things. I know those things happened to you. That's not why he is arriving. That's not what he's trying to fulfill. He's saying, I know what happens in you. 
He's not saying, I know what happened to you. He's saying, I know what's happening in you, and we, Jesus and you, can do something about that to prevent the damage in your soul and the damage in your life and the damage in the lives of people all around you. Jesus says, I know you're trying to create a $6 million man because all those things that have happened to you, but let's try to take care of what's inside of you. Rather than dealing with your own efforts on your own part, let me reconstruct you. So the disciples struggled with this, making their $6 million man. The scribes did, the Pharisees did, the Sadducees did, I do, and so do you. So this sermon was not for that section. It was for this section and this section because all of that is in us. The seeds of all that is there. And that's what Jesus wanted to take care of. So Jesus did more than write a book of laws. He lived a life before the very eyes. He lived, he fulfilled the law before the very eyes. He lived it out before their eyes. He died it out before the very eyes. Those same people, those people and the rest that were hearing this, they saw him die, but they didn't see him just die. They saw him rise again, victorious over sin and victorious over death for all of eternity. And he's doing the same thing today before our very eyes. How? How is he doing that? Before our very eyes. Before your very eyes. Look around. As we talked last week, salt and light is you. As we follow Jesus and become his disciples, we're the, run, the ones, not because we're sinless, but because we're forgiven. Not because we're perfect, but because we're being perfected as Jesus reconstructs us. Not because we don't struggle, but because we do struggle. That we call unrighteousness and sin what it is, and we try to move away from it. You struggle with your stuff. Good job. I struggle with my stuff. The world, we struggle with the stuff of the world. Why else would we get upset about de- presidential elections and debates? And why else would we get upset about wars and foreign lands that we've never been to and we probably never go to? Why do we get upset about the sanctity of life and dead babies that we'll never get to know? Because we know it's not supposed to be this way. That's why God designed it differently than that. We know we long for better. We long for righteousness, for a better me and a better you and a better world. We strive to take steps forward in our own life. And as we talk, to be salt and light, it doesn't terminate with me. I got to give it to the world. So as I I look around, I mean it. I was thinking about the stories I've heard of you, things that you're doing to not keep it to yourself this week. It humbles me that you're not trying to just be like Jesus for your own self, but you are trying to transform the world. It's humbling and it's exciting, and I just want to tell you that Jesus is proud of you because that's what he's trying to get at here. The point that Jesus emphasizes in verses 19 through 20 is that you can become consequential influencers for Jesus on earth. By the way, you live your life like Jesus lived his life, that we get more and more filled up. It doesn't mean that we always get it right, but we can change the world. No po can be different. Northwest Peoria can be different because of Jesus in us as he fills us up to the full. So quit trying to build your own six million dollar man. Just stop. Go to Jesus. Let Jesus reconstruct you. So we're going to get ready for communion now. So take your communion elements. If you haven't got them, you can go get them. Open them up and get ready, but don't take them yet. We'll take them together in a moment. I want to remind you of a few things that we do when we take communion. When we take communion, we really do two things. Remember what Jesus did and what Jesus is doing. So what that means is what Jesus did is he actually lived that life, that perfected life, and he died so that your eternity would be different. And we remember that he did that for your eternity. But it also says until he comes. So he also died for your Monday. That's what we say here at Journey. It's not just an eternity thing. It's a Monday thing. He was the fulfillment of the law. We're stating our belief today as you take communion that we believe that Jesus said that, he fulfilled the law, and he did that, that he died for your sins. He lived that perfect, sinless life. He raised from the dead to conquer death and destruction and sin and to make a perfect eternity. And he did that for you. So what we're going to do in this moment is sing another worship song. And here's the thing. We want you to be in the presence of Jesus in this moment. So that means if you want to cry, the lights are dim. It can be between you and Jesus. If you want to put your hand, your head in your hands, do that. If you want to stand, if you don't want to listen to 
the words, but you just want to have a private moment of prayer, this is between you and Jesus because you're thanking him for what he did. And then I will come back after the song and we'll take communion together.
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Jesus lived a fulfilled life, fulfilled for you. It was filled to the brim. It was real. He lived it the way life was designed to be lived. And then that body of his that was real was broken for you. Take this in remembrance of him. As you get ready to take the cup, we know that in Scripture it says that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And that's kind of a, a hard thing. It's a hard, one of our hard teachings, the whole blood thing. But here's the thing. You offended God with your sin, with your unrighteousness. But he loves you, and he wanted to make amends with you, for you. In order for something to be forgiven, the forgiver has to forgive the offender. That's us. Jesus is the forgiver. Take this in remembrance of him. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for these teachings that can change the way we live now on Monday, not just in eternity. Thank you for transforming us, for reconstructing us. We are in such desperate need of it in our own lives and in our world. Thank you that that's what you're doing in us and through us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So a couple of quick things. I want to put these statements up for you. This is the, the things I want you to take, no matter uh, what we're teaching on in this, uh, each week. Hope, and then doing something with that hope. Never stop hoping for Jesus' kingdom to come here on earth. We know it's supposed to be better, don't we? Hope for it. Never give up on hope. But then be a part of bringing it about. Never stop pushing for the kingdom of God on this place on Monday. We are part of that. So we hope for it and we push for it. So we, ha we have another moment, time for the Barlow's to come up and the elder team to come up. So let me explain something to you. This is a family moment. It's a cool thing. It's good news. So we are an elder-led church. That means that we have a team of elders where we come together and we provide oversight, strategy, spiritual leadership, all the things that are in scripture that are required of an elder. And so we have... Um, a process that we go through when we bring new elders on board. So Scott Barlow is our newest elder, and so he has been scrutinized. You can clap now. He has been scrutinized as I kidded around. I moved in with him for like three months just to get the inside. Cheryl objected, but just kidding. But he was scrutinized. He filled out some questionnaires, and he's been functioning as a provisional elder for almost a year now. So he's been part of the team and his provisional status is over and we presented him to you uh, about a month and a half ago. That's our process. And we've received him in. So today he's no longer provisional, but he's an all-in elder as if he wasn't already. And his family's here with him and, and we're circling around him to receive him into eldership. So would you stand up please? Because we're a church and he's an elder of your church, but you extend a hand forward because you're praying as well as we pray over Scott and his family. God, we thank you that you trust us to change the world and that you use churches like ours in Northwest Peoria to change this world. Thank you that Scott and Cheryl and their kids have been changed by you and this church. In the five, five and a half years that they've been a part of us, they have been transformed. Everything that we talked about this morning. And they've taken one step after the next step after the next step. And here Scott is before you and before us, becoming an elder of this church. So Jesus, would you, by your spirit, anoint him to do things that he could never do by himself. And the same for Cheryl and the same for their kids. And we thank you that we get to experience that. Would you continue to make them more and more passionate, just, not just for themselves and their great family, but for this community and for the world. So we receive them because you've anointed them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give them a hand.
All right, so as you leave today, there's prayer tables back there. If there's something that you want to praise the Lord for or something you need prayer requests that you need to share, then you can go back there. And one quick shout out. I've never had an analogy from a sermon as good as this one, so they get a shout out. I called us Rot Stoppers last week and they made t-shirts. So they, they get an extra communion cup just for the juice. We'll see you next week as we continue our series.